historical way of connecting a cable to a, a tower. I'm talking about 100 years from now. And this has disappeared because uh, all the, the negative, the drawbacks of this technology, when we deviate a cable with force and the f cable is looking at fatigue loading, you have extremely rapid damage of the cable in the saddle. And so this has disappeared of many recommendations and codes, talking about Germany, for example, or in the US, where in Germany, saddle has been completely banned for, for a period of time. It comes back to the picture, thanks to this type of development where we, companies like VSL have achieved to develop a saddle which does not compromise the fatigue performance and uh, which is giving some solution for the classical uh, problems of this technology. How this works? First of all, it works by having an injection inside the cavity. And second, and this is the beauty of the system, we have experience with wedges Let's apply, let's apply this wedge concept uh, all along the saddle. So the strand, instead of sitting in front of a, of a round or a cavity, with uh, only one unique point of reaction, it sits on the cavity which has a shape which is providing two points of reaction. And we amplify artificially like this the friction, and uh, hopefully we do it without uh, jeopardizing the <coughs> the interface without creating a fretting corrosion. And of course, uh, we have a main application of saddles is a exhaust bridge. And it's been quite successful in, a, in, a, in Europe. Just uh, one reference I'd like to mention about saddles. Uh, this is uh, one application in uh, San Francisco, seismic area. And uh, there are designers, uh, crazy enough or interesting enough to apply saddles in a seismic area, a friction saddle. And uh, how they did it is uh, thanks to this uh, injection of material inside the hole. This material here uh, has a viscosity. So the combination of uh, dry friction plus viscosity permitted to, uh, to have a nice uh, control of uh, movement during a, a service type of uh, earthquake in uh, San Francisco. I suppose you know which cable is going to which hole and you do it one yes. at a time. Correct. Which is strand, I mean. Each strand is parallel. Each strand is stressed one by one. And each strand goes from a one anchorage in a defined hole through the saddle in a defined hole. And you probably the jack them from the bottom to the top, yes. We jack the strand uh, on two sides. No, I'm, I mean, you have got How you fit in the a cable, I've got many strands. Correct. You start jacking the lowest one first, yes? Or not? No. So what will happen the, if you put, it's going to crush the other ones? Or what? No. Okay. The matrix, the matrix of the matrix. You mean in uh, the straight question. line, it's OK. This matrix is designed to hold the force of the other strand while the other ones are empty. So it doesn't matter which order you Correct. Have. You can uh, even anti hole. But it's a very good point to say because after installation, due to the fact that having installed first the top one and then the second the one on the bottom, we have to come back and reabsorb, readjust the force on all the strands to absorb some uh, setting of the magic itself. So it's possible it holds the force, but you have to reabsorb by restressing a bit the top one at the very end. To, uh, to absorb the, the vexation that has occurred inside the saddle. Do you use the same technology for external pulse tension in continuous uh, structures as no. mediators? Talking about, no, not that one. Okay. We have different type of technology for this. Thank you. Any other question? So, this saddle has been used on this uh, Odariat Sekiro project, second panel in, uh, in Malaysia, and uh, uh, East Europe, Poland, India, a lot of applications as well. Um, here is a nice application where we have been using saddle with a 169 strand, so it's uh, one of the biggest <coughs> cables we have installed is with saddle actually. This is to say that uh, the size has no impact on the performance. 
you can upscale this technology with how many strands you want. It's, uh, it's quite modular. Few slides about links. This is an alternative to Savile, where instead of having a continuous cable from one side to the other through a tower, we uh, connect it through a steel structure uh, in the tower. Uh, it's a design telling you the size to have a correct behavior between the steel member and the concrete tower. Requires a bit of a touchy detail there, but uh, this is an alternative which can work. Some aspect has to be uh, looked at in terms of durability, and especially at the exit part of, the, of this link. Talking about link, it's an element which is designed to code and not tested, basically. But then we have to uh, consider the right loading on this link, and of course, if you want to have a uh, uh, redundancy in your design, this element, and this is uh, mentioned, for example, into your Eurocode uh, 3111, has to be designed to uh, support the load of uh, the breaking load of the cable, and not necessarily the actual load on the cable. Why? Because uh, if you want to have enough room for uh, ductility, the failure has to happen on the cable and never on this element, which has a very small reserve of ductility due to the, the size. So these are projects where Linked has been installed. Yeah. Some references, mainly in India and some in Europe. Uh, words about transition device, uh, dampers or guides. Uh, guide deviator uh, are usually required uh, to control that your stake cable with a deformation you're gonna have during service will not touch the structure, basically. In terms of uh, deviation control, it's not a necessary component for a VSL anchorage. But it's very important in case your deviation can go quite far due to whatever effect, service effect, to protect any contact from the cable to the structure. Talking about vibration. <laughs> Sorry for the sound, thank you. So vibration, this is a, so, These are type of vibration which are meant to be uh, addressed by use of dampers. Uh, we call it the wind vibration. So this is an example. Uh, this is what we call uh, the Meikunishi. Uh, the first time we have, uh, we have uh, experienced um, Radiant wind vibration back into the 1980s. Um, not every cable technology are subjected to this type of vibration. The reason of this high amplitude vibration is because this technology of cable, which is a PWS, they have a very, very small intrinsic damping. So any energy introduced by the wind to the cable is kept there inside. While the tec strand technology of cable we have an independent strand. They can have each strand an independent movement, creating internal shocks, internal friction, and this is dissipating energy. And therefore, they are not subject to this type of vibration. But still, for long cable, um, solutions are required. And uh, solutions, they are basically either internal <coughs> dampers or external dampers. VSL is promoting the use of uh, friction or rubber damper. They have the disadvantage of being nonlinear, so difficult to calculate in terms of performance. Friction is nonlinear and rubber as well. However, uh, these dampers have very good performance, a great performance. There is a technical reason behind, is because they introduce perturbation into the model behavior, and therefore you disseminate the energy in one month into several modes, which can be directly damped by the cable itself in form of intrinsic damping. And this makes this damper extremely efficient. And they are compact, and a very important point is that a damper is dissipating energy, meaning it transforms mechanical energy into heat to one component, and this component uh, is wearing with time. And no chance, a damper contains wearing components that have to be maintained. And the idea of these dampers is to have this component as small as possible and as easy to change as possible, basically. Does that 
design life. A damper is meant to control vibration. The vibration is affecting the design life of a cable. Why? Because it's, it damages the uh, components here for corrosion protection. I'm talking about the sheeting, the ceilings, all the specific components that are very sensitive to vibration. So by making use of dampers, you increase the design life of your stake cable. This is a, a one solution to manage the design life of a stake cable. Sorry? Yes, except that uh, the strand itself, I mean, if you come back to this, uh, to this, sli to this slide here, uh, when you look at what type of damages you have on a stake cable because of vibration, it's more or less current protection. Today, we have uh, only very few examples of wire failure due to vibration. There is an example in the US, uh, Sabo Bridge, maybe you know that name, where uh, the, the, the cable failed due to vibration, but it's not the, it's not the wire, it's the connecting part of the cable. Uh, a wire that are very strong in terms of uh, vibration loading. But every component you add onto the wire for corrosion protection, these ones are very vulnerable uh, with vibration. But yes, you're right, seven bridge, cable has been replaced, uh, losing wires due to vibration. So. Damper can be uh, installed for different shock absorber. You mean? Yes, correct. Here we're talking about uh, dampers for cable. So typically, like this, uh, you can see it here. Uh, you have the cable here, and the cable is moving. The damper is at the interface between the fixed part of the, the deck and the cable itself, and it dissipate this uh, electric movement energy through dissipation. It's a different technology compared to the deck damper. And basically, uh, how you assess uh, the performance of the damper <coughs> on the cable is by doing a test and you measure uh, the log deck of the cable. Log deck being uh, how the damper is reducing the vibration per cycle. And you measure how much uh, two consecutive cycles has a difference in terms of amplitude. And from there, you derive the performance of the damper. So uh, there is a bit of... Uh, Analysis behind to anticipate the performance of it. And uh, this type of analysis, of course, uh, DSL as a depth supply can support you as designers to define this. It depends on the frequency of the uh, uh, cable itself. Yes, absolutely. As absolutely, it depends on the frequency. Um, here is uh, typically, uh, just to show you this, for the same state cable, it's various technology of damper tested. And these are various modes, for example. And as you can see, the frequency can depend upon the mode. And, um, and every technology of damper doesn't behave the same way with the frequency. <coughs> some dampers will provide performance independent from the frequency, and some others independent from the amplitude. And this depends on the type of, uh, of uh, function or behavior your dissipative component has. But there we can have a deeper discussion on this. If you wish. Usually for DIC we use a tuned mass damper. This is a certain mass is connected to the structure through a spring which is Correct. absorbs the kinetic energy. Correct. This tuned mass damper have been tried for state cable. But the big difference there is that a state cable <laughs> can have a, can be sensitive to a many different modes of vibration. And the tuned mass damper, you tune it for a specific type of frequency and therefore you are losing the other performance for the other modes. So what is very important for state cable is to have a damper which can work with similar efficiency for various different modes of vibration. <coughs> I've seen them being tied together. You know, if these are cable going that way, they're tying it that way. Is yes. that efficient as well? Cross ties, you mean? Yes. Yes, cross ties are extremely efficient <coughs> for that vibration. First time I saw it, we started doing it that way. Yes, extremely efficient, except that uh, it creates a lot of durability issue. Yeah, you have to keep looking at it. And uh, installation issue as well. And How when easy you have to get there. Exactly. 
and cross tie to uh, manage durability, they have to be tensioned a bit. As you tension, you cross ties, you jeopardize the geometry of your state cable. Yes. So whether you want to, uh, to invest in all these drawbacks just to get the benefit of the vibration control that you can get with this damper is a different question. So basically, the response is yes, cross tie is extremely efficient, but it has a lot of drawbacks. We can propose this, provide these cross ties on demand, but this requires a, a real assessment in terms of design life of the structure because the drawbacks are significant. For specific application, we can have external dampers, which is basically applying the same concept of uh, dissipative element, but to a structure attached uh, outside of the cable itself. And this is uh, another technology of dampers making use of uh, uh, rubber material. Um, let's talk about cable free lengths uh, and corrosion protection. Today, uh, most recommendations um, require to have uh, a several, multiple layer of corrosion protection. And we're talking about uh, two nested barrier and the interstice between these two barriers is filled with a hydrophobic medium. So this is a typical FIB concept where the two barriers are here, the PE coating, here the zinc, and in between you have um, this uh, wax or this uh, grease, whatever, uh, um, hydrophobic medium. Um, VSL is promoting as well, as we said, the uh, active uh, system for current protection, which is making use of dry air, where we have a little barrier, which is a stay pipe itself, <coughs> because it's tight. We have a zinc inside it, and in between you have a dry air, which is a hydrophobic medium as well. Uh, but this uh, raises up the question of the durability of this uh, stay pipe. It's, if it's part of the corrosion protection concept, therefore it has to be, uh, the performance of the stay pipe has to be assessed in terms of durability. This component is plastic, HDPE. We know plastic are uh, degrading with uh, UV and, uh, and light, and therefore there are tests to be performed to qualify this. And just to keep in mind that many colors are available. Not all these colors survive the same type of uh, solar exposure. We have a much higher, better performance for the white, gray, black compared to the red. A red stay pipe in Dubai will not stay red for a long time. This has to be uh, kept in mind of designers to make sure that the right color is chosen. A stay pipe, uh, primary function is to protect uh, the stay cable, and secondly, to make the stay cable having uh, satisfactory dynamic behavior uh, according to wind. And again, what it means, it means have a, a lower drag coefficient and other and making the state cable unsensitive to uh, this uh, uh, galloping phenomena or vibration phenomena. So this has to be assessed through uh, wind wall testing, and this type of test has required regularly to assess uh, this performance. Today we are making use of uh, RIP technology to, uh, to achieve this, but there is a uh, various technology of RIPs. Another issue which is picking up uh, lately is the ice. It's not hopefully an issue here in Dubai, but uh, on some countries it's extremely uh, uh, <coughs> dramatic as an issue. Um, uh, ice is today accreting on state pipe during a cold period, and when the, the temperature is raising up again, it falls in big piece and really introduces severe damages. And this is the latest big track field of development. First to understand how this ice uh, accrete on the state cable, and seeing what solution can be implemented to avoid this ice to fall down. It's just an example of uh, requiring uh, university research, and we have PhD ongoing on this matter, exactly on this matter. Heat it up. Sorry? Heat it up. Make a big radiator. <laughs> Global warming, you know about it? <laughs> exactly. So these are solutions we have in developing. Heating is one of these. Uh, we have others, and uh, this is what we investigate today. We, have, we are very proud to, uh, 
to, uh, to achieve uh, the lab test on one solution which has been proven in lab actually to be working extremely well. We can go detail on this uh, one day. Um, LEDs, uh, this concept uh, picked up here in Dubai a long time ago for a project which is not yet here. Uh, it's from the engineering point of view a very nice challenge. Basically, it's uh, questionable. I think it's a matter of uh, architects. But in terms of design, um, it's a fantastic challenge. Introducing a light onto a steel pipe and expecting this light to be in the same position after five years and shooting in the same direction because this is what is part of the architectural design is a challenge. And we are very happy to have uh, taken this challenge and uh, find a solution for this addressing either the installation, the replacement of the LED, and of course, uh, ensuring an LED positioning all along the lifespan of the state cable. Sure, yeah. So uh, we have had uh, the first mock-up here in Dubai for a couple of time. A uh, few words about cable protection. We're talking about uh, protecting these area here <coughs> where users can access. Uh, Defining um, a protection for the state cable goes through a risk assessment. It depends upon the design first, whether this design has enough redundancy to accept damage on the state cable, and upon some uh, risk related to the use of the structure. And uh, to help designer or owner to make this risk assessment, we have developed uh, this uh, different protection level uh, grading, rating, where P0 basically is uh, when you have no protection only for uh, environmental impacts, uh, rain, wind, dust, and so on. P1 is what you're going to find on most of the bridge is an uh, unintentional uh, uh, e effect of a user on the cable, anti vandalism environmental impact. P2 is typically for a bridge which is missing a bit in terms of design of uh, redundancy, and therefore we have to make sure that an accident happening there will not jeopardize the bridge itself, or in a place on a structure which, has, uh, which is a bit strategic in a sense that uh, it cannot afford to be closed for a period of time for replacement or repair. And P3 is for uh, strategic infrastructure uh, located in a geopolitically unstable area uh, like uh, the U.S., for example. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, these are... Uh, yes, heavy protection, blast protection, and so on. Talking about fire protection, this type of event can happen. So we have many examples of, uh, of uh, events where, um, where a truck can catch fire we're talking about a hydrocarbon fire, 110, um, 1,100 degree. The duration of the, the fire depends upon the, the situation of the structure, whether it's far away or close to a, to a firefighter uh, facility and so on. And from there, we develop fire protection. These fire protection that are here to provide to the cable itself, the maintenance elements, sufficiently low temperature so that you can hold the force. And this is uh, assessed by test. Uh, tests today, they are mandatory according to PTI. Uh, they are coming onto the picture in FIB again. And uh, there are various type of freighting or fire protection, mostly depending on, on the, the time, the duration of fire. The temperature of fire itself is, uh, is 1,100 degree, basically. Correct. So we, we call it redundancy. The bridge should stand even if it loses one cable. Yes, correct. Today, at least if we follow your code uh, as a design document, we should have redundancy of one cable. Yes. And, uh, and some of the code is even more, and some is less. But then, from there, we, we take a decision on whether the design has already accommodated for a fire risk or not, and if not, we can uh, reduce the consequence of that risk by having a protection. 
it's a risk assessment approach which involves design and, and component itself, basically. So this is an example of a, a bridge making use of fire protection uh, and blast protection. One slide about blast protection, ultimately, um, um, BSL is developing one solution, uh, capitalizing on the fact that as part of design, uh, a state cable uh, is under permanent situation, is stressed to 50% of GOTS, meaning 50% of the cable capacity is redundant. It's there just for safety. And the idea of this concept is to make use of this 50% additional strands to protect the core one inside in case of blast, basically. And how we do this? By having an evil protection for each strand, and the outer strand are deflecting whatever load, blast load, and provide protection for the core one inside, making the blast protection extremely compact and, uh, and lighter a bit. So now we have been to almost all these components. If you have any questions, um, don't hesitate. Uh, shall I go on state cable development? Um, R&D, uh, I had a, a feedback earlier today about uh, state cable uh, technology as having evolved extremely quickly uh, lately. State cable is still a, a domain of uh, steel engineering where there is a lot of development today. And um, the R&D can be made either in-house, as VSL is doing, and as well with universities in partnership with the designer as well. And, um, and latest development are this LED and ICE uh, issue. Uh, we haven't been talking about this installing state cable, same as for sanctioning. It's, uh, it's uh, technical work and requires a bit of training. And today, uh, this training <coughs> is not systematically given into universities. It's the role of each uh, specialist contractor to train their staff into installing state cable. The performance of a state cable, and this is something quite important, does not only depend upon the quality of its components. It depends as well on how on site this component has been assembled and uh, installed. And the uh, VSL has developed a, um, an academy where there is a, a mock up where these installation methods and uh, tools and equipment can be, can be commissioned, where staff can be trained uh, before going to a site where they have to perform for the very first time. Do you think you can train the staff for other companies? It's a good question. The response is yes. We are willing to offer this. Uh, for a contractual scheme where uh, the cable is installed by another party, yes, the intention is to uh, offer that these uh, workers are trained into our academy for our components. Yes. What will happen to guarantees if somebody else installs it? Uh, if, if this is a, a very classical contractual discussion. And this is why it's very important to have uh, the labor installing the state cable or the post tensioning system trained into our facility. And uh, for sure, uh, this is going to solve many you issues. To anybody else, you will install it. <laughs> yes, it's a good point from my colleague. Uh, in every situation, uh, we are supervising the installation on site, always. Um, stay cable uh, uh, testing and uh, development qualification. Um, today, um, just uh, I'm going a bit fast here, but I come back afterwards. Uh, there is no such thing as approval for stay cable, and there is a reason behind. It's a very fast evolving market. The technology is changing quite uh, rapidly, and therefore there is no international body capable of uh, locking today an approval type of, uh, 
of uh, qualification. And therefore, we are working with uh, recommendation documents. And these recommendations are for designers, for you to ask the right questions to people like us in terms of uh, performance for a state cable system. Um, today, the two documents which are used worldwide are the PTI, mainly coming from the US and the FIB coming from Europe. And they are providing guidance on what type of testing should be required for what type of application. And these documents are the base for, uh, for us as a state cable supplier to achieve our design by the right qualification testing. So today we have a, lately a new release of uh, the PTI last year and uh, as well a new release of the FIB last year, which is an achievement from a long uh, whole work from uh, the FIB committee. We have as well now another document is a code, it's a Euro, Euro code, and uh, the Euro code is in process of being reviewed as well. And the uh, next new thing that's gonna occur on this Euro code now is that the appendix related to testing will be become normative. Meaning today is just an informative appendix on the Euro code for testing is becoming soon normative. It means that uh, it's a must to have uh, this system uh, tested. So what type of test are we talking about? We're talking about a fatigue test where we are aiming to uh, confirm the actual fatigue performance and the bending fatigue performance. This is a uh, new commerce into the uh, FIB 89. And this is to address a uh, ULS situation, design ULS design situation. For SLS situation, we have a uh, uh, test to qualify the serviceability of the system, which is a lictness test. We make sure that uh, the system uh, is offering a suitable uh, service performance and for solar friction test. But it's not everything. We have as well qualification of uh, stay pipe or encapsulation, which go through uh, wind tunnel testing of two types, uh, drag coefficient and uh, and uh, dynamic behavior. And uh, basically we have as well, on top of this, tests for the deviation device, dampers. These tests are mainly done on field and they are here to, um, to prove uh, our assumptions on damper requirement and design. A few words about installation, quickly. Uh, stay cable. The way they are developed and promoting uh, this company is uh, strand by strand systems, which are stress strand by strand. And maybe you can come back to your question about uh, service installation. And basically, it consists in two uh, erecting first uh, a stay pipe with one strand inside. And from this stay pipe in place, threading one by one each other those strand and stressing them using uh, an equipment. Hopefully this equipment is a bit uh, modern by having automatic record of information and so on for a more smoother relationship with the designer in terms of exchange of information. Does it have anything to do with grain as well? You're talking about the stay pipe. Yes, correct. These ribs, they are here to cater for a phenomena of vibration. We call it rain and wind, but not only and especially lately, based upon the last PhDs uh, performing front on the CSCB, they found out that uh, the biggest positive impact of the rib is for the dry galloping. And the theory of the rain and wind can be questioned again, whether we're talking about a surface a texture or whether we're talking really about a rain rivulet. Yes, correct. But this can be uh, summarized into a dynamic behavior. So this is why I call it dynamic behavior with the wind, or wind interaction, dynamic interaction with the wind. Yes, it's a good point. So here, uh, installation of stay cable with saddles. Um, with, with saddles, uh, two cable are installed in, uh, simultaneously, the one on the left and the one on the right because the strand itself, the maintenance element, is going through the tower. It's one piece of strand, anchor, one anchorage, 
to the other going through the tower. And uh, of course, this is the type of equipment you have on site for installation. The important point is that it's not heavy equipment and uh, this is why this technology of indoor strand cable has picked up in front of other technologies like PWS. It's because we are manipulating low weight equipment and uh, components. We're not here to manipulate uh, the 25 tons cable. We're just manipulating a coil of two tons. And with this one, eventually, we're going to make uh, uh, almost 100 tons take cable. Hmm. Uh, last but not least, uh, monitoring, maintenance, repair, uh, what happens during the service life of a state cable and a state cable bridge. Uh, monitoring is quite fashionable. We have to manage the service life of a structure. A state cable is a very good prop to understand the behavior of a state cable bridge. Knowing the force of a state cable gives you a lot of information on the bridge itself. itself. And um, these structures are highly exposed to environment and therefore that requires a bit of monitoring. So we're talking about uh, uh, on-site measurements, data manipulation, treatment, and uh, interpretation analysis. So all this process uh, has to be implemented. Um, maintenance of state cable system. Today, uh, one information about uh, new technology, and especially this one from VSL, is that they are designed to be maintenance-free. This is a opposite to a log coil system, which requires, by design, a regular maintenance. This type of cable requires no maintenance for 100 years, let's say. However, this information, this design is based upon information we have today. And a big part of what happened on state cable is uh, unpredictable or unpredicted, and therefore, inspection is uh, required and is a must. And uh, another way of saying things is that a maintenance program is established for state cable based upon finding from inspection. And from finding from inspection, you understand what would be particular span of particular components of the state cable. And therefore, you can tune your design plan. So when approaching a project with state cable system, according to the state of the art technology, we have to bear in mind that the final maintenance plan is developed along the service life of the cable itself based upon finding from inspection. Be visually inspected for this higher limit. Um, on this bridge, for example, we have an access. About the periodic, periodic uh, inspection. Yes. You, you have two locations in your state cable which re where you can have uh, efface, where you can tune and understand how it behaves with age. It's near the anchorage. This is either here or here on top. So, so you have an easy access here at this anchorage. This is reachable, but what about the top? In the tower, you can reach the anchorage which is inside the tower. Usually these towers are built like uh, with a void inside, with a core inside, <coughs> you climb up, and from there you, you access to the, to the anchorage. And then, uh, if you want to have an idea of what happens outside of the tower to the cable, either, and this happens, we go with climbers, or you check what happened at the bottom there, which is uh, more loaded. And if you find out that you have no issue here at this location, you can deduct that maybe there is not much issue on top as well. The risk that you have an issue on top is lower. If now you start to have recurrent issues at this location, Maybe you want to invest into a, having a more deeper investigation of what happened on the top. So you, you, can, you can adjust your uh, inspection program according to your findings. Usually this tower is reachable uh, at some point from the tower? From the inside? Yes. Yes. It depends on the tower design. It depends on the tower design. Yeah, correct. <coughs> is there any approach to, uh, to uh, monitor this, this detail using cameras or whatever? There is with some of the some of the modern uh, repair and uh, monitoring things where drone technology and things is now improving to an extent that you can get much better access using drones to fly up and do camera inspection externally. 
that, that's developing uh, with time and the improvement of the current technology, so which is a lot easier than, as Rashid said, the older method, which was you sent climbers up. Because I feel this point is not always reachable. Sometimes this tower is solid, not yes, correct. If you have a cell, for example, if you have a cell, the tower is solid. So you have some design where there is already some uh, lifting device attached to the tower. I'm having in mind, for example, uh, Wadi Leban in uh, Saudi, where you have a lift directly there attached to the tower for inspection, for future inspection. And you have projects where nothing has been considered. And then, of course, when you arrive on this spot, on this project, and where nothing has been considered, you have to establish or to organize an access on top, which can be difficult or easy depending on the situation. It's a good point. It's a good point in the sense that in a phase of design, uh, access for inspection, sometimes they are forgotten and they are very important. And uh, a design permitting inspection, and providing access, uh, it's a lot of uh, headache glass for the future. Yeah. So, uh, force monitoring or other type of monitoring can happen. We have two technologies for force monitoring load cells, uh, we have as well a two different type of load cells, uh, magnetic load cells, uh, resistance load cell, and we have a behavior assessment, let's call it a vibration assessment methods for force monitoring, which can be extremely accurate, extremely accurate. As a, for information, a small story, uh, Queen's Ferry Crossing, one of the biggest take care project in uh, Europe, uh, the designer has considered the vibration assessment of force at the most uh, reliable one for his project. And uh, has finally tuned the bridge according to information received from a vibration force measurement. Repair and retrofit, um, very important. This is a type of incident that can occur on the stake cable. Uh, here is an example taken from, uh, from Ting Chao Minyang in, uh, in China, where a barge basically, uh, after a storm, detached from, uh, from the harbor and hit the stake cable bridge. And it hit it by the crane through the cable themselves, which was a very nice and interesting exercise of how to, uh, to, uh, to test <coughs> stake cable replacement by uh, occupying the smallest part of the, of the bridge deck. And uh, it was a nice training for VSL. Um, behavior of the whole structure, um, here uh, VSL kind of uh, offer um, capabilities in uh, health monitoring, uh, assessment of health of the structure uh, based upon measurement of data from uh, sensors. And um, here we go as a conclusion about inspection. Few references, maybe. Uh, this is the end of uh, my uh, speech. Sorry for having been so long. Just a few bridge pictures. Um, Queens Ferry Crossing, Mersey Gateway. Um, saddle project. So these are state cable with uh, saddles. Um, hangers, uh, roof stadium. Um, Exodus bridge, uh, various type, mainly using saddles. Uh, stay cable bridge, making use of saddles and uh, link, possibly, which uh, bring us to uh, this conclusion. Um, about stay cable, um, what is important is um, it's uh, one of the most dynamic uh, field in civil engineering where we still have development, very interesting development where we have still PhD university running on. It's an interesting topic. Uh, what has made VSL being a leader in that matter is uh, by performing the R&D themselves and uh, by, by proposing and offering a range of uh, components, modular and a wide portfolio of different solutions for various applications. And uh, voila. So this is it. Sir again. The wind coming from down. From down. Yeah. Uh, the deck is responding to the wind coming from uh, 
Yes. Yeah, so, so, uh, we'll, so from the point of view of the state cable supplier, uh, yes. So what we we call it uh, parametric station is when the, the the wind or the traffic is affecting the deck behavior, and this is exciting the state cable itself. Yeah, the question is how the tension is the bridge deck is very lightweight. Yes. The wind is more. Yeah, the static yeah, right. part of the wind force is, is marginal. What is important is, uh, is how dynamically this deck is behaving exposed to that wind. And maybe the deck is vibrating because of the wind. And maybe this movement of the deck <coughs> introducing vibration to the state cable. And this starts to be quite critical because this is one of the most severe cause of vibration on, on cable. What we call parametric is when the vibration of the cable is induced by a movement of the deck itself. And this happens when the, the cable frequency and the mode of the cable are close to the one of the structure itself, especially the deck. But the static force of the wind itself is not significant in terms of loading compared to the, uh, to the other loading you have on the structure. How much initial pretension in your comments? I mean, um, um, you have to pre stress first. And remaining reserve for the SDLs and uh, live loads. So initial pretensioning, how much you recommend for that? Um, it's a good question. Uh, today, we wish not to not to to force designer to have an initial pretension, meaning that if we are facing a state cable where the pretension is very low, ourselves as a state cable installer will artificially organize a. Uh, interface between the wedge, the strain, and the anchor in a way that this has no impact on the performance. So to make things easy, if you have 30% of guards as tension, it's perfect. It's quite fast, quite easy to manipulate. If you go much below, if you have only 10%, 5%, if you have 10% or 20%, we're going to apply what we call <coughs> power seeding. We're going to power seed the wedge to avoid any issue linked to the fact that tension is low. If you go even below this, talking about a few one ton per strand, or even less, then we'll power lock the wedge. That means we're gonna lock the wedge to a higher force to make sure that nothing can happen even though you lose tension into the, the cable itself. So depending on the situation, we adapt ourselves, our method of uh, implementing the force on the cable to make sure that uh, we have a satisfactory mechanical performance even though the tension is very low. But bear in mind, this cable, they are working very well with high tension. This is why cable are good. They like high tension. High tension means uh, good behavior. So do not hesitate to optimize your cable cross-section to maintain the tension percent at a sufficient level. Unless you have a service requirement of flexibility, otherwise, uh, let's go optimal. In one of your slides, you mentioned uh, guts, like Guaranteed ultimate tensile strength. Yes. In the range of 50%. Yes. Why is it so low? Is it generally billing needs to work to 75% maximum? It's a good question. Um, usually on uh, post tensioning, we go to 70%, 80%. 75% oh. generally in billing needs to be. Yes. Building. Correct. Yeah, this is correct. Why is low is it? On post tensioning. Because in buildings, this, because the tension, because the post tensioning system in buildings has no fatigue loading, mm -hmm. almost zero fatigue loading. And no deviation. You put the cable at the position. You put the concrete uh, you, uh, on, on, your, uh, on your slab. Then uh, when the concrete is squared, you, you will introduce the tension. And then the force will be the same. And the duty will be the same. And then it's finished. This take cable, we have the force changing with time. And this will introduce fatigue. And therefore, we need to have some reserve of capacity to cater for this uh, fatigue loading. And this is the reason why we reduce uh, the tension. So maybe it's too pessimistic here or too conservative approach, the 50%. And this is today under discussion to this recommendation document. But this is one reason. There is another reason, is the relaxation. Uh, we, one of the aim uh, in using the strand is to have no relaxation. The strand is a very deep product, the seven wire strand, because it has very limited relaxation. But we guarantee this very, very small relaxation when the force is not that high. And 50% guarantees you that you don't need to bother with relaxation at all on the cable itself, not on the structure, but just at least on the cable itself. 
I remember there was an equation called Ernst equation. Yeah. For the actual stiffness mm, of yes. the of the cable. E equals to yeah, because e the length. cable length and other things changes it. Uh, I think uh, this equation is related to the sag of the cable. Yes, yes. correct. Yeah, let's call it uh, the second order, second order uh, effect. Yeah. Uh, you have to for that. Yes, this is correct. We don't don't, don't think it is PA over L. It's different. Yes, correct. Uh, but this is uh, depends upon the geometry. So if you do the calculation with the software, and make sure that your software <coughs> has a secondary order calculation modules inside, and then you can just you know the answer equation. My software was hand calculation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you have your hand to calculate, just don't remember. <laughs> don't forget the, the question is true. Yeah. One question. During construction, yeah. uh, you stress you stress a state, then another one, another one, and then your previous states obviously undertake more force. Yep. So during construction, how much do you recommend to not exceed what the guts? Um, this information is provided into a FIB document. There are information about it. Uh, usually what is applied is... Uh, uh, Even if on the permanent you go like 50, yeah. during construction you can go to 85 if required, right? Or, or 80, or as long as you control the elongation, etc. In, in the FIB, the value of 60% is mentioned as a maximum during construction. But uh, I, I don't think you would go much higher because during construction, all the support repos dead load are not there. You do not have all the parapet and so on, so, and you don't have the maximum light load. 50% guards is a maximum service. Meaning that under permanent situations, you would have maximum 40. And the reconstruction usually is recommended not to hit 60 percent. While for we know for individual strands and especially the first one, sometimes we can go up to 70. But uh, this is allowed, assuming the force not there for a long time. Yeah, yeah, it's temporary. And only uh, one or two strands, not more. That's correct. Sir, can this allowance be used as in the extreme cases, like during your construction, you happen to have an earthquake? So your forces, like, yeah, you yes. have like 10 stays in the design, but you are only more accurate. But then this stays going to take much more higher forces. Like, the, in those cases, can you go up to 70 or 80? Like, do you have any testing done for it, or do you have any research done for it? But what you do is we do a tensile test. Yeah. For sure. That, that's for and uh, with tensile test, you have to prove uh, 95, 98% of guts. And uh, um, uh, sorry, 92% of IUTS, which is the actual force on your actual capacity on the cable, 95 of cut. And this, we know, we know the cable can handle this. So it's just a redundancy. It's just a safety. Whether you're gonna fail with your cable because of a stressing at 60, 70, I'm not sure. But you have to respect sufficient safety rule. But uh, we can always discuss on uh, on this detail how much force you want to have per strand or in the cable during construction. Yeah. Last question. Last I, question. I, I had seen 2000 catalog for 2000, this strange system. At that time, you were allowing 45%. So in 20 years, you have done good technology research. So we have jumped from 45 to 50%, which will help structure engineer. In that catalog, we had a stress variation around 200 MPa under full tension and less tension. So now, how much we can allow the stress variation in a strain? You say making use of uh, which strain? Uh, the, the 1860 or the 1860? 1860. Um, it, it's, it's a good question. I try to find the, the good answer for you. Yeah, <laughs> like, because I remember, <laughs> like, uh, I was fortunate to work on Mumbai Pune, like, yeah. uh, uh, this. Uh, the Mumbai extra dose bridge and uh, the cable supported bridge which had a span of 250 meter designed yes. by HNTB. <coughs> At that time, we were using 200 MPa stress variation and 45 percent. Yeah, it was sometime 0. 0.42. 2000, yeah, 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.42, not 0. 0. 0. 0.45. 0. 0. 0. 0.42 yeah, is coming yeah. from the lock from the German Dean standard. Yeah, but I'm just saying 0. 0.42 we were looking at. 
So today, uh, the, the FIB says you can have 50% maximum service. And to make use of this 50% maximum service, that means that the state cable has undergone a test at 45% and 200 MPA tuning cycle. 200 MPA and tuning cycle, yes, correct. This is for state cable application. If you go extra dose, you can go higher than 50%, you can go to 60% maximum service, meaning that your system has undergone a test at 55 maximum 